Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Trumpet Daily. Last month, you may have seen a few stories about the so-called gentle succession currently underway within the House of Windsor in England. The Independent reported on January 20th that the heir to the throne is expected to take on more of the 87-year-old queen's duties, including overseas visits, as part of a slow convergence of their roles. So it may be that we're drawing near to another coronation of a British monarch, something this world has not seen in more than 60 years. Over the last few years, the House of Windsor in England has actually made quite a few headlines in April of 2011, an estimated two billion people tuned in to watch Prince William marry Kate Middleton at Westminster Abbey. When William's father married Diana Spencer back in 1981, more than 750 million people tuned in to watch it on television. At the time, it was the most popular event ever shown on TV. While watching the grandeur of Prince Charles' wedding back in 1981, Herbert W. Armstrong was inspired to write a long article about the royal family for the Plain Truth magazine. He noted Britain's unique ability to host such a, a glorious and colorful extravaganza. It was a spectacle unparalleled, he wrote. The bride, he said, was bright, cheerful, and happy. And then Mr. Armstrong went on to say this, I do not know whether the present generation of royal family know and believe it, but I've been informed that the royal family of two or three generations ago did know that the British sovereign is in fact a continuation of the dynasty of King David of ancient Israel. Now that's quite a statement to make. And on today's program, we're going to examine some critical history about the British throne that most people have long since forgotten. The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. When Queen Victoria ascended to the British throne in 1837, popular faith in the monarchy was in decline. But over the course of her 64-year reign, uh, she revived that faith, and it lasted for at least a couple of generations. I'd like to begin the, the program today just showing you a short clip uh, from the movie uh, The Young Victoria from uh, 2009. So I began to dream of the day when my life would change and I might be free and I prayed for the strength to meet my destiny I will be good That's an inspiring uh, ceremony, uh, particularly if you know about the history behind it. And in the next week or two, we're going to produce a few programs here uh, that look at some of the details of that ceremony. Today, I just want to focus a little bit on this remarkable queen, Queen Victoria. To begin with, let me just quote to you what it says in uh, a, a journal from 1837. This is the London Sun, and it's an article. It, it, it was printed around the time that she was coronated. Queen Victoria, uh, and it's talking about the origins of the British monarchy. Notice what it says here. Between the seat and this board is enclosed a stone commonly called Jacob's. It says later on, history relates that it is the stone whereon the patriarch Jacob laid his head in the plains of Luz. It's talking about history that's recorded in our Bible in Genesis 28. 
If you'd like to go get your Bible and read along with me, uh, this is something that, uh, as the London Sun pointed out back at the time of Victoria's coronation, uh, that was just history. It was common. People were more aware of it then than they are today. Now, here in Genesis 28, there's, there's something amazing happening, and commentaries, of course, just go crazy almost, trying to figure out what it means. And if we just let the Bible interpret itself, if we just accept what the Bible has to say, it really makes some of these, these amazing ceremonies, like what we might see in a, a few years ahead of us, really stand out as, as awe-inspiring events when you know how deep their roots run. Genesis 28 and uh, verse 10, it says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in the place to sleep, it says there. So notice first that Jacob takes these stones, plural, uh, and he puts these stones, as the scriptures say, for his pillows. He probably wrapped it up in some kind of skin or, or uh, some kind of uh, coat to, to make a pillow that he could, uh, he could sleep on. And then in verse 16, it says, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. I mean, he was jolted. Something happened. What was it? What was it that really shook him? that made him aware of the fact that God was there, that God had been there. Continuing on in verse 17, it says, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other than, than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. You see, something incredible had happened at that place. God was there. Something incredible happened to make Jacob realize that God was there. He understood that God was opening up a great door for his work at that time. Verse 18 continues, uh, And Jacob rose, he rose up early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and he set it up for a pillar, and he poured oil upon the top of it. And so now these stones that he had gathered and wrapped, perhaps, in his coat, these stones, plural, had turned into a single pillar stone, one stone, a pillar, as it's called in the Bible. And this moved Jacob to anoint it with oil, as it says there. He poured oil upon it. He anointed this stone. Now, that statement back in verse 17, where it says, how dreadful is this place? It really is uh, not that great of a translation. The meaning there, uh, if you look into uh, the, the Hebrew language, is to tremble with joy. So it was a moving experience, to be sure. Uh, but not so much dreadful as it was uh, just an astonishing miracle that really struck fear, proper fear, the fear of God in this man. Now, few people realize it today, but what we're studying here in Genesis chapter 28 is actually the beginning of England's stone of destiny. Now, as I said a moment ago, that used to be more commonly understood and accepted just to go back to that one quote from the London Sun, we read this uh, earlier, history relates that it is the stone whereon the patriarch Jacob laid his head in the plains of Luz. This history that's talked about here in Genesis chapter 28, history relates this. Let me now go to a quote from Herbert W. Armstrong. Uh, if you've watched us for very long, you know that Mr. Armstrong had a lot to say about this history in Genesis with the great patriarch Abraham and his family and all the blessings that God promised to bestow upon his descendants and how those blessings were suspended for a long period and then bestowed upon our peoples in these latter days. He also wrote a lot in this book about this covenant that God made with King David. King David, an unbreakable covenant that was to continue right through to the end of our days and the return of Jesus Christ. This is what he said in the United States and Britain in prophecy. Many kings in the history of Ireland, Scotland, and England have been coronated sitting over this stone. He's talking about Jacob's pillar stone, including the present queen. The stone rests today in Westminster Abbey in London. And the, of course, that's now uh, outdated. 
The English gave it over to Scotland. It's in Scotland today, but it'll come back uh, for the next coronation. In any event, he writes, and the coronation chair is built over and around it. A sign beside it labels it Jacob's pillar stone. And he cites Genesis 28 and verse 18. This is from what he wrote back in, uh, I guess, 1980 was the last version of the United States and Britain in prophecy. And since that time, of course, the sign was removed that, that called it Jacob's pillar stone right there in Westminster Abbey. And then even more sad than that is the fact that the, uh, the English gave it up to Scotland. Why is it that they would be so quick to just give up this, this history, this rich history? Well, it's a sign of just how uh, degenerate our faith is today. The faith of Israelites. Verse 19, continuing on from uh, Genesis here, it says, And he called the name of that place Bethel, and the name of that city was called Luz uh, at the first. That's the city referenced in that journal from back in 1837. Uh, but coming back to this verse, Jacob called this, this uh, place Bethel, which means the house of God. This is where God dwelled. He even called the stone the house of God. You can look into the New Testament and see how that Jesus Christ is, is called the rock in 1 Corinthians 10. That's what this stone was a type of. That's what this stone that Jacob slept on symbolized. That great rock. Who is Jesus Christ? That subject, I suppose, is, is uh, for another day. We can get into that as well at some later time. Notice verse 22. It says, And this stone, this is Jacob speaking, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you shall give me, I will surely give a tenth unto you. See, Jacob started tithing and obeying God, supporting God's work, and he calls this stone God's house. This was the beginning of the great stone of destiny, Jacob's pillar stone, that stone which has been with the people of Ephraim for thousands of years since. It's all inspiring history. It's history that one day this world will understand. But today, many are blinded to it. They don't see it. They've lost this precious, precious truth. I want to take you back to that London Sun article. Keep in mind again, this is from 1837, right at the time that uh, Queen Victoria ascended to the throne. It says in the London Sun, this stone, this stone was conveyed into Ireland. Notice the history that it tracks here. It was conveyed into Ireland by way of Spain about 700 years before Christ. From, from there, it was uh, taken into Scotland by King Fergus about 370 years later. And in the year 350 B.C., it was placed in the Abbey of uh, Scone. This antique regal chair, having, together with the golden scepter and crown of Scotland, been solemnly offered by King Edward to St. Edward the Confessor in the year 1297, from whence it derives the uh, appellation of St. Edward's chair, has ever since been kept in the chapel called by his name. I mean, it, goes, it might have a few of the dates off, but this, uh, I mean, this transference of the, th of the throne is talked about at length in the United States and Britain in prophecy. Mr. Armstrong talks about the, the overturns, as the Bible puts it, to go from the land of Judah up into Ireland and then Scotland and then down into England. And this was something talked about in the London Sun, of all things, back in uh, 1837. That stone today, it's in Scotland, as I said, but it's still under England's authority. And uh, it's always played a key role in the coronations of these monarchs. Why? If not for Bible history, if not for the fact that it's rooted in this history that we've talked about here today, why, when, how did this stone come into play? Last summer, you might remember when, when uh, William and Kate had their baby boy, uh, Prince George, um, there was a lot of hoopla then, just like there was for uh, the wedding uh, previous to that. And uh, I want to note another quote now. This is a more, much more recent one. This is from the London Evening, Evening Standard. 
from last year, 2013, July 23rd, 2013, and it's talking about the new baby and, of course, uh, this history with Queen Victoria once again. It says, Queen Victoria convinced that the, 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 the subject is actually, our, is the new baby, the new prince going to be circumcised? And then this piece says, Queen Victoria convinced that the British royal family was descended from King David had all her male offspring circumcised. The tradition continued through Edward VII, the Duke of Windsor, and Prince Charles, who was circumcised by Jacob Snowman at Buckingham Palace in 18, 1948. His brothers, Andrew and Edward, also underwent the, the same procedure. So they also went through this, and it goes back to, as this article points out, uh, it goes back to what Queen Victoria believed. And the fact that she had her sons uh, circumcised because she was convinced that the British royal family descended from King David. How about that? A queen on that throne who understood that her family came from King David. You don't hear that sort of thing coming from the throne today, that sort of belief. You don't find that kind of, of uh, Bible history coming out of that throne in London, going back to this history with Queen Victoria, how much did she know about what the Bible says? I mean, if she believed she, she came from the line of King David, did she understand about that covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel 7? That everlasting covenant that God promised would endure forever? Did she understand about that covenant? Did she understand that she was actually sitting on not her own throne, but on the throne of God? That's what the Bible calls it, David's throne. Let's look at 1 Chronicles 29 here in conclusion. How much did she understand? And looking at what's happening today with this gentle succession, as I said at the top, that's now underway in England, how close are we? to the next coronation and when it happens, if it does in the years ahead, judging by the amount of attention a royal wedding and the royal baby has gotten, what kind of attention do you suppose will be focused on the next coronation that happens on that British throne? Perhaps God is getting our minds ready for the coronation of all coronations. That's also coming soon. First Chronicles 29 and verse 23, it says, Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. Notice that. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord, the throne of the eternal, God's throne. This was God's throne that he set up, that he established, and that he said would endure forever. This is not the throne of a man. David understood that. Solomon understood that. And they believed it. And there's so much to cover on this subject. As I said, you have to break it up into several programs. When you add in all that's in, in 2 Samuel, when you add in that's all that's in the book of Psalms and elsewhere, Jeremiah and what he did after the fall of Judah, the mysterious commission that he had, it's incredible, fascinating history. God calls it David's throne, of course, because he, he wants us to be part of that vision and to understand that just as he chose David right out of uh, the shepherd's field, He's bringing along others and giving them that same opportunity. He calls it David's throne, but it is actually God's throne because he established it and he has preserved it. He has preserved it. It is true, as Mr. Armstrong said in the United States and Britain in prophecy, that Queen Elizabeth and soon to be her son most likely, and that family, they are descendants of King David, and they do rule from God's throne. One quote here to conclude from the United States and Britain in Prophecy. This is Mr. Armstrong's work. He says, now we come to a seemingly incredible fact. 
fantastic, almost unbelievable, but true. While David was king, God made with him a perpetual covenant, unconditionally, which God cannot and will not break. This covenant is even more amazing and less understood than the unconditional covenant with Abraham. The covenant he made with Abraham about those blessings to come upon his descendants. Few people understand that covenant. Even fewer, Mr. Armstrong said, understand the truth about the covenant that God made with King David. It's talked a lot about in this book, The Key of David. The Key of David book, 157 pages. And it really complements, it perfectly complements what Mr. Armstrong wrote in the United States and Britain in Prophecy. Hopefully you have that book as well. But, but today I'd like to focus your attention on this one and ask that you go to thetrumpet.com or you can, you can call the number there on your screen. Go to thetrumpet.com and request your free copy of the Key of David booklet. It's a beautiful vision and it's wrapped up in some of this history that we've talked about here today. Go to thetrumpet.com, request the Key of David booklet and we'll send it out to you free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you again next time on The Trumpet Daily.